I'm going to ask you something which, intuitively, should seem very possible. The task at first glance isn't anything complex, but the more you try, the more you realise something is off. The task is to find a rectangular cuboid where the volume, surface area, and perimeter are numerically equal. Assuming you've looked at the thumbnail, you already know this is impossible. But why? Keep watching, and I'll tell you what is hidden behind this seemingly harmless problem. As with any problem like this, we can gain some insights by looking at a simpler case. In particular, it makes sense to bring this question from 3D into 2D and consider a rectangle rather than a cuboid. Now, we're looking for a rectangle whose area and perimeter are numerically equivalent. First, let's introduce some algebra. Let the side lengths of the rectangle be a and b. Hence, the area is a times b, and the perimeter is 2a plus 2b. Setting the area equal to the perimeter, we get that ab equals 2a plus 2b. Now we have one equation and two variables, so it seems obvious that we can find such a rectangle, and in fact, an infinite family of rectangles. You can verify this by seeing that our equation rearranges to ab minus 2a equals 2b, and hence a equals 2b divided by b minus 2. So any positive real value of b that you choose greater than 2 leads to a positive real value for a, which hence can be used as the side lengths of our rectangle. While it is a subtle fact that a and b must be positive real numbers, since they represent the side lengths, this will be a key into looking for some contradiction in the cuboid case. Now, I want to continue in the simplified rectangle case, but by considering it from another perspective. However, before we can do that, I will have to introduce the topic of roots of polynomials and Vieta's formula. Those of you familiar with this topic are probably confused as to how this is in any way related to the rectangle or the cuboid, but just give me a moment and I'll show you why. Vieta's formulas are a set of equations which let us go from the roots of a polynomial to the coefficients of a polynomial. Let's start off with the quadratic polynomial, f of x. Suppose that this polynomial has roots alpha and beta. The factor theorem states that alpha is a root of f of x, or in other words, f of alpha equals zero, if and only if x minus alpha is a factor of f of x. It follows that x minus alpha and x minus beta both divide f of x, and since the degree of f is 2, since it's quadratic, we can say that f of x equals x minus alpha times by x minus beta. Expanding that gives us that f of x equals x squared minus alpha plus beta x plus alpha beta. Hence, we have found the coefficients of x and the constant term in terms of our roots, alpha and beta. You might start to be putting some pieces together. These coefficients look awfully familiar. Recall that our rectangle had a perimeter of 2a plus 2b and an area of a times by b. We know that the perimeter equals the area, and we can say that this equals some positive real constant, 2n. The reason for the 2 will become apparent shortly. Now, this is the magic trick. Consider letting the side lengths of our rectangle be the roots of some quadratic polynomial f of x. Hence, we know that f of x equals x minus a multiplied by x minus b, which equals x squared minus a plus bx plus ab. But we know that minus a plus b equals minus n, as we defined n, and ab equals 2n. So our polynomial f of x equals 
x squared minus nx plus 2n. Now our quadratic only has one constant which we can vary freely. In particular, when n is greater than 8, we can see from the graph, or by completing the square, that there are precisely two positive real roots which correspond to the two side lengths of our rectangle. Isn't that wonderful? Now I know what you might be thinking. We've done a lot of nice and correct maths, but we haven't really gotten anything new. But where this really gets interesting is when we return back to three dimensions and consider the cuboid, because this is much more applicable in the higher dimensional case. Now, consider a cuboid whose edge lengths are a, b, and c. Therefore, the volume is a times by b times by c. The surface area is 2ab plus 2bc plus 2ca by considering the areas of each of the six rectangular faces. And the perimeter is 4a plus 4b plus 4c by considering the 12 edges of the cuboid. Again, we want to set all of these equal to each other. So say that the volume equals the surface area equals the perimeter equals some positive real constant 4n. Just like before, consider letting a, b, and c be the roots of some cubic polynomial f of x rather than quadratic. Then, by the factor theorem, f of x equals x minus a, x minus b, x minus c, and expanding gives us the following expression. Just like magic, these coefficients seem to align perfectly with the expressions for the volume, the surface area, and the perimeter. Replacing the coefficients in terms of n, we get that f of x equals x cubed minus nx squared plus 2nx minus 4n. And again, we have f of x in terms of some single parameter n. Our final task is to study the roots of this cubic equation. In particular, to show that the resulting question is impossible, we must show that f of x never has three positive real roots. Those of you well versed in complex numbers know that, assuming there are no repeated roots, a cubic with real coefficients has either three real roots, or one real root, and two complex roots, which come in conjugate pairs. In fact, for all positive real values of n, f of x falls into the category of one real root and two complex roots, but we have to prove this. Just a side note, I do realize that I just randomly introduced complex numbers, so just so we're all on the same page, a complex number is a number with a real part and an imaginary part, where the imaginary part is some multiple of the square root of minus one, denoted as i. We represent these numbers in the complex plane rather than on a number line, and the introduction of complex numbers allows for the fundamental theorem of algebra, which states that any polynomial of degree n has n roots in the set of complex numbers. I realize that this is extremely brief, and I'd recommend watching one of the multitude of videos available on this topic. But for this video, let's return back to the problem where we're considering the cubic f of x. One approach to showing that f of x has one real root and two complex roots would be graphical. Our goal would be to show that the equation y equals f of x intersects the positive x-axis at only one point, and hence the other two roots wouldn't lie in the real numbers. We know that if the cubic equation has no turning points, in other words, no minimas or maximas, but only a point of inflection, it by definition must be an increasing function. However, an increasing function can't go up and then down and back up, so it can only intersect the x-axis at one point. More formally, in this case, our cubic would be bijective. In the other case, the cubic will have two turning points. If both of these turning points lie either above the x-axis or below the x-axis, then the cubic can only cut the x-axis at one point. 
Proving this fact is a good exercise in basic calculus, but nobody wants to watch through all the algebraic details. So I'll leave it as an exercise for the viewer to show that this is the case for our cubic f of x. The other approach to showing that f of x has one real and two complex roots is much faster. All of you should be familiar with the quadratic formula, probably one of the most infamous equations in all of maths. The part of the formula under the square root, b squared minus 4ac, is known as the discriminant, and the sign tells us whether we have two real roots, one real root, or no real roots. Well, there's an analogous cubic discriminant, which we can use for this problem. Discriminants of the cubic px cubed plus qx squared plus rx plus s equals zero is this mess, which I've shown on the screen. If this is greater than zero, we have three real roots. If this is equal to zero, we have two real roots. And if this is less than zero, we have one real root and two complex roots. Now we substitute in the coefficients of f of x to get a new messy bit of algebra. And then finally, this expression. Now notice that we can take out a factor of minus 4 and squared, and the remaining expression is a quadratic. Completing the square on this quadratic shows that the cubic discriminant is of the form minus a squared multiplied by b squared plus c. And since squaring any real number is always positive, we always get a negative cubic discriminant, and hence we've shown that f of x has one real and two complex roots as required. Again, just like my last video, if you see this solution written up nice and neatly, it's extremely short and almost seemingly impossible to find. However, I hope the thought process shown in this video was useful in illustrating how someone might arrive at such a solution. And just to add, this isn't the only solution to the problem, although it is by far the most elegant. This equation can just be tackled with regular algebra, but this idea of using a related polynomial to describe a completely unrelated seeming problem is very common and could lead to things like generating functions for sequences. However, this is probably a topic for another video. For those of you still here, I thought I'd talk a bit about how I came across this problem and why it's one of my absolute favorites. A few months ago, my teacher showed me a booklet full of interesting Olympiad style questions used for university interviews called TBO's Problem Solving Booklet. And this was problem number 23. I remember thinking about it during one of my math lessons and I randomly tried setting the side lengths as roots of a polynomial and the result just immediately popped out. It's that satisfaction I gain which motivates me to continue doing Olympiads and I hope by sharing this with you, you can experience the same satisfaction. But anyways, Thank you for watching.